Welcome to tonight's Vermilion Local School District Board of Education regular meeting. Today is Monday, October 11th, 2021. Um, Mr. Clancy, call roll, please. Mrs. Seth. Here. Mr. Johnson. Here. Mrs. Russell. Here. Mr. Habermill. Here. Mrs. Ennis. Here. All members present. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. the half a unit of instruction of financial literacy prior to graduation for kids. Um, that has now passed the house also. Um, and so this would apply to students entering ninth grade after July 1st, 2022. So we have a little bit of time here. Um, so it has now passed the house. It's now gonna be going back to the Senate for a final um, vote on it. And then I believe over to the governor after that. Um, included in that is something that extends my notes here. Um, extends the temporary flexibility for districts that are substitute teachers that do not have a four-year degree. Um, that would be extended through the 2021-22 school year. It looks like that was something like an emergency clause that was put in because we were having such shortages um, with the pandemic and everything going on. So that is also included in Senate Bill 1. Um, it looks like they're expecting a vote on that exit. That's all that I have. Yep. Thank you. Um, tonight, Phil Pepin is not going to be able to be with us, so we have Mrs. Deleese, our curriculum director. She's going to be seats, seating in for him. Great. So we're going to start. Um, there's a couple of things on here, and one was eSports, and I'm going to have Jen Bengal present on that. Um, we've, we've talked with our administrative team. There's I, I, it, it's kind of a new thing. There are kids getting actual scholarships for colleges. It, it might blow some of our minds about this eSports kind of activity, but it, it, it's pretty big in some districts, and there's a, a company called Ohio eSports that it's actually free to join that league, and there's um, some things going on, and I'll have Jen share that. Um, we have, and I, I did bring this, but it's not on here. It'll probably be on next month, an MOU. We do also have a robotics club. Um, and we, we have our advanced robotics, robotics two, that will actually be going to competition. Um, we didn't have that last year because Mr. Bosch was new. So there, this will be next, you know, this is not something you're voting on now, but we kind of wanted to just introduce it to the board. Um, but you'll be seeing this. Um, and Jen, if you want to come on up and... Lisa Ori prefaced the conversation, keep an open mind. Um, so one of the goals when we were looking at our data for this year at the high school was just to get more student involvement um, in ownership in the school. And one of those ways is through participation. When we look at our pay to play data, about 38% of our students were involved in the extracurricular this past year. We'd like to take that to about 50% this year. And we have those populations of students that they're not traditional athletes. Um, and they are not really into like book club or some of the other club offerings that we have. So we um, were able to connect with the, one of the creators of the eSports organization of Ohio. Um, and so basically it is what it sounds like. It's you, there's a series of games and students from one school can compete against the varsity team of students from another school. So just to kind of add some legitimacy to this conversation, this is a, um, an artistic rendition of the Cedar Point eSports arena that is currently, you know, by the end of this year is breaking ground. They're building this to hold competitions and eSports events. And over 30 Ohio schools, um, universities, and colleges actually offer scholarships. There was an Amherst student, he was not on their eSports team, um, but he was consistently on the top leaderboard for, um, I think, it's, um, League of Legends, um, and the uh, college reached out to him and offered him a full scholarship 
because he was so good at that particular game. So those are just, these are the particular games that are offered. They're rated T, uh, teen or lower. There's very strict rules and regulations that eSports has put in place for competing varsity teams. A lot of, in a lot of districts that, um, there's over 50 districts in Ohio, 150 schools that have a varsity eSports team, um, but a lot of them fall under the umbrella of athletics in these districts. Um, so, to the important part here, what does the startup cost involve? Um, and we've actually, um, I have had some teachers that express interest in wanting to get this up and running. So they've gone out to universities and colleges that offer these scholarships to ask for a donation of a PC. I've emailed them as well. Um, I have a Vermilion Education Foundation grant um, that is asking for some of this cost of the startup. Um, so we have the PCs would be the major cost and we uh, would ask for six for this season. So typically there's a fall season and a spring season. Our goal is to at least get into this spring season and have an eSports team of our own. Um, and so the, some of the other pieces of equipment there. So I'm more interested in any questions that you might have that came up through that short introduction to the eSports. Yeah. So that's for six students? That is for six, six students. Um, and so how this works, let's say that, I'll go back to the games real quick. Let's say that we have um, six students that are really into League of Legends, six that are really into Fortnite, six that are really into Rocket League, and sometimes it's 4v4, it's not always 6v6, um, but then they would form like a varsity Fortnite team or a varsity League of Legends team. Um, at the very, very basic level, what we want to do Super Smash Brothers only requires a Nintendo Switch as the gaming console. Um, we have a number of students that would maybe form like a Super Smash Brothers team, varsity team, and we would, you know, only need Nintendo Switches for, for that particular game, but all the other ones require a PC. And I think an important thing too, Jen, when we went to Amherst, these games or eSports told us that they play on different evenings. So like you might have six computers, depending on like, so Monday and Wednesday might be these games, Tuesday, Thursday could be these games. So it kind of just depends what the kids are interested in. And, and what we would sign up for. The kids are practicing and competing here at the school. So the coaches would have some practice time where they would oversee. Um, and there's scrimmages that coaches from other schools set up with our coaches, for example. Um, and then they would practice here. And then there would be certain competitions on certain days for certain games. Is this high school and middle school? Or? This is only for um, 14 and above so far. They have not, Ohio eSports has not offered anything younger. Um, there's a lot of, you know, like for example, I think Valorant, Fortnite, those are all rated teen. Um, Any thoughts on like how big would the team be or how, is there like a cap on how many students we could handle? Well, or? it depends on, um, you know, availability of coaching and it depends on a, like how, what games they would really be into playing. So you could have, you know, like I said, six people that maybe would do a Fortnite varsity team and six people <coughs> would do like a, a Rocket League varsity team. So you could have different people depending on what their strength or what game was their strength. Now in a lot of schools it's gotten so big that they've actually had to hold like competitions to narrow down, you know, they might have six people on a team with two alternates. So will this be a sport they can letter in them? So there's been conversation with OSHAA right now to make this an actual like recognized athletic varsity sport. And so I would not be surprised, we were just talking about this earlier today in a meeting, but by the end of the year, if it was not a approved sport where they could actually letter in. Even if it wasn't OHSAA though, we could locally award a varsity letter for something like that if we wanted to, right? Yeah. I mean, because, you know, band gets a varsity letter, right? So, sure. yeah. It's just, all the time that I want to get something. Right. You know, yeah, if you're going to compete. Shift of yeah. thinking, you know, for a lot of, I mean, it's just a shift of thinking. Like, we're going to varsity letter in Fortnite, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I think it would, I, it's exciting in that it's another opportunity for our students 
colleges and universities are obviously recognizing it and saying that there's you know value in being able. I mean, I I have three children. On my three, I have one that's really into. He likes Rocket League and Fortnite occasionally, and you know just hearing him talk back and forth with his partner to try to. I mean, it does involve teamwork. It does involve communication. It does involve collaboration. Um, so it's just a. Another opportunity for that population of students that might not be involved in traditional um, extracurriculars at school to have another another chance to participate. We have teachers who are wanting to coach right now. We have we have about five people come forward, um, two that were really really passionate about it, like already made a logo and reaching out, just actively trying to recruit students. Um, we were talking to students, you know, in the beginning of the year, just trying to generate interest, and we had a number of them that were pretty excited. About and so, um, and I don't know how many filled out um, Mr. Asbeck, which is one of those teachers, and he was kind of collecting the data on students that indicated interest. So. Is there like a season? For There's two seasons. There's a fall season and a spring season. So our goal, if we're able to get the funding for this, our goal would be to participate in the spring season. Now, in the funding, will they be funding to award a supplemental contract for the coach? So we have one part of that MOU that Lisa provided okay. a few moments ago. Um, part of that would involve the eSports coach. And then the other costs are all the startup costs, like the, the um, initial equipment, like the gaming PCs, um, a couple chairs, headphones, keyboard, mouse, things, things like that that, would go, that they would need to their equipment to play that sport. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the second part of the superintendent's report is the family first night. Um, this was an initiative that I have seen other districts do and, and when I um, took on the new role I really wanted to put a focus on this. Our first one is coming up November 10th and we'll have one March 9th. What's interesting about this is it is truly family first. We will not be holding any after school activities. We will not be assigning homework and we're asking families to spend quality time together. Um, what I'd like to see is we do have some um, companies and organizations in the city that are willing to offer some fun things for families to do. It's a small list. I wanted to at least start small, and as this grows every year, we're hoping to add more um, companies to it. So we have the Olive Scene is offering a free mini bottle of olive oil. Ritter Library is going to be having special events and activities on November 10th for our families. Um, Dr. Andrea Fisher is offering free eye appointments if you call. Lake U Baptist Church is offering a family movie with popcorn. So like. You know, and, and we've had some other companies reach out and say, hey, we'd like to participate too. But, you know, we're really encouraging families to eat dinner, play a board game. This is a time that you don't, you know, that we as a district, besides Boys and Girls Club, because we realize families need that, this is a time for us to slow down, spend time together, and we don't have to worry about cramming in homework or running to sports practice or anything like that, that we can just really enjoy our families. So, um, look for this. That's going to be November 10th, and we'll have another one March 9th, and I'm looking forward to this growing every year. So just wanted to share that with everybody. Any questions about family first? Um, the third item is a recommended resolution for the board to approve um, the memorandum of understanding between the Vermilion Local School District Board of Education and the Vermilion Teachers Association. So that'll be attachment A. Um, the memorandum of understanding is entered into by and between the Vermilion Local School District Board of Education and Vermilion Teachers Association and is for the express purpose of modifying the terms and conditions of the negotiated agreement between the board and the association effective August 31st, 2021 <coughs> through August 31st of 2022. Whereas the 2021-2022 co-curricular and athletic supplemental schedule included in the September 1, 2019 to August 31, 2022 VTA negotiated agreement at some levels have been miscalculated by the Ohio Education Association. 
whereas the Board of Education has recalculated the co-curricular and athletic supplemental schedule for the 2021-2022, and the association has agreed to those corrections. Now, therefore, it is hereby agreed by the by and between the board and the association to use the board, co-curricular, and athletic supplemental schedule for 2021-2022. Um, and I think, Mr. Klingstrom, you might have some more information if there's any questions on it. Yeah, so all that has happened was when we do our negotiated agreements, they're for three-year terms typically. Um, what I do is I'll go through and calculate the salary schedules and the supplemental uh, salary schedules as well. Um, the OEA also does the exact same thing. So this year, everything lined up just fine, but this year when we went to go pay the supplemental contracts, the payroll had different numbers than what was in the contract. And so for us to pay differently than what's in that contract, we need to have an MOU in place agreeing to that because uh, ultimately when I get audited, they pull up that contract and they'll see those two different numbers. So this is just, just making a small adjustment, a couple dollars here and there to each one of those uh, supplemental contracts. Just on a quick question. On a plus minus end of it, do we know roughly the difference? It all changed just based on which supplement was paying higher and which one was paying lower. Some were off a dollar or two just because they were smaller supplementals. Some of the larger ones were off by maybe $25. Okay, so we're not talking $50,000 here. No, no, it was okay. very minor changes. It's just they weren't exactly going to match up to what, what we needed gotcha. to pay. So we had to make that change. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Dennis? Yes. Mrs. Stepp? Yes. Mrs. Russell? Yes. Mr. Habermill? Yes. Mr. Johnston? Yes. Motion approved 5 0. Thank you, Mrs. Please. And Mr. Clinchard, with the Treasurer's report. Thank you. Um, number one, recommend a resolution for the board to approve the financial report for September 30th, 2021, and then attachment B. I'll move. I'll check that. All right, taking a look at the general fund uh, revenue first. Through the month of September, the district received $9.79 million in the general fund compared to 9.78 this time last year and 9.95 uh, in fiscal year 20. Uh, so as you can see, the district is right on pace to collect the same historical average of revenue that it has in years past. Moving on to the food service revenue, through the month of September, uh, we have received $30,867 in food service compared to $5,565 last year and $35,166 in fiscal year 20. Um, again, historically, the district starts to see little revenue in the month of September. Um, and, and again, just because we're open so few days in the month of August, and then we typically see full participation reimbursement in October for the September months. So the, these revenue numbers will go up uh, starting at the next quarter meeting. Taking a look at all fund revenue by month uh, through the month of September, we received 10.2 million compared to 10.1 million last year and 10.8 million in fiscal year 20. Again, overall the district is on pace to collect its amounts uh, revenue that it historically has in years past. Moving on to expenditures from the general fund through the month of September, uh, the district has spent 6.3 million from the general fund compared to 6.1 last year and 6.0 in fiscal year 20. Uh, overall, it's on, the district is on pace to spend slightly more this year than it has uh, historically. Uh, main contribution to this is just salary costs are going up, benefit costs are going up, uh, purchase services costs are going up. Uh, moving on to food service, through the month of September, we have spent 167000 from food service compared to 138000 last year, 178000 in fiscal year 20. Um, food service, for the most part, it, it's in line with its historical averages from spending point and from a, from a revenue standpoint as well. And then taking a look at all fund revenues by month, through the month of September, we have spent $6.8 million compared to $6.9 million at this time last year and $7.1 million in fiscal year 20. 
Uh, again, so our, our total expenditures so far this year are right in line with our historical averages. And then lastly, we'll take a look at cash. First, we'll look at the general fund. Uh, through the month of September, the district has 21.3 million in cash compared to 19.7 at this time last year, and 20 million in fiscal year 20. Taking a look at food service through the month of September, uh, the district has 46,000 in cash compared to 39,000 last year at this time, and 235,000 in fiscal year 20. Uh, one point to note here though, with full federal reimbursement this year, uh, the ending food service cash should increase slightly each month from this point on. Um, the food service from the federal reimbursement, I think is $3.06. We typically charge $2.75. Every single meal that we sell is going to be reimbursed at that $3.06. That's going to exceed our expenditures each month. And again, our, our, our cash balance should only grow from this point on every month. When you're talking about reimbursement, you're talking about how all the kids are free lunch right now, we get reimbursed for that? Yeah, we get reimbursed, exactly. We so get the difference is what? The difference of the profit to the district then, basically? Yeah, the difference is going to be, so if we were to sell those normally, we would be able to sell them for 275 but because of everything that's going on, we're getting reimbursed by the federal government for $2.06 okay. per meal as opposed to the $2.75 per meal. So it's a little bit of an increase from the normal price that we would sell. And then lastly, we'll take a look at uh, all cash. Again, through the month of September, the district had a total of 24.9 million in cash compared to 22.6 million at this time last year, 23.2 in fiscal year 20. Um, and then lastly, we'll take a look at our investments. Um, again, investments, they're, they're just not nearly what they have been historically. Uh, so through the month of September, the district earned a total of $44,306.30 on interest compared to $48,330.96 last year. This is a difference of $4,000 or 8.2% less in interest this year than we have compared to last year. Any questions? Call the roll, please. Mrs. Ennis? Yes. Mrs. Stepp? Yes. Mrs. Russell? Yes. Mr. Haberman? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Motion approved 5 0. Number two, recommend a resolution for the board to approve the agreement with Franklin Covey, the leader in need, to provide training, coaching, and materials for unconscious bias and equity in education professional development at a cost of $3,500 and attachment C. Second. This is just a professional development that we have for staff here. Any questions? Is that one that, that all staff is going to be required to take that? I don't believe it's all staff. I think it's majority of staff. Is it just uh, certified staff? Yeah, it'll be on January 14th. Yeah. Okay. And teachers. Call the roll, please. Mrs. Ennis? Yes. Mrs. Stepp? Yes. Mrs. Russell? Yes. Mr. Haberman? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Motion approved 5 0. Number three, recommend a resolution for the board to approve the updated contract with frontline education time and attendance beginning October 18th, 2021 through June 2025 at a total cost of $36,309.66 plus an additional $7,500 for the implementation, which is a one-time charge. That's attachment D. All right. Second. Uh, what this is, so we use Frontline for our absence management. One of the, the things that we don't have the ability to, or I should say, that we don't use it for, though, is, is, is uh, time clocking. And so what this does is this this will bring everything electronic. Right now, when we have timesheets, whether you're a bus driver or a custodian, you're, you're doing a manual timesheet. Um, supervisors are reviewing that. They're sending it over to payroll. Payroll is then trying to decipher when overtime started, when the sit time is, when, where everybody is, were they in ASAP for, for absence when they put themselves down for eight hours, vice versa. And so what this does is that works with the system we currently have, brings everything electronic. Uh, it'll show up flags that, that somebody didn't clock in, so it'll be like an employee locator to say, hey, 
this person is scheduled to work, they're not in ASOP for absence, but they also didn't clock in, is this person here or not, those types of things. Um, it'll work well too, uh, people can use it whether they want to use their phone, whether we want to just have the biometric screening as, as, a, as a time clock for them. Um, administrators will have the ability to go back in and make adjustments if we need to. Uh, it'll really be helpful though, particularly with the transportation side of things. What happens is you have your regular route that you've been on. People are driving the regular route and they have a field trip that they want to go on. The field trip's a different rate than the regular rate. And then as they're driving to the field trip, once they get to the field trip, it's sit time, which is another different rate. And it's just a, a big time consuming thing. Uh, moving this to electronic will free up a lot of time, not only in payroll, but also in the amount of time the uh, supervisors are going back and checking with each employee to make sure that this is in fact how, how and how their time sheet works. And then it'll also help, um, again, we get a lot of requests from, from the transportation department saying, I know I did all these field trips, but I don't really know how much I should be making. Can you show me the calculations for how you calculated my time? This will help with that as well. And so again, this is just something to really, really streamline the process that we currently have in place now. And that cost, um, I know the cost was, was 36. What it, what it is, is it's basically just a little less than $10,000 a year. And then the 7,500 is just the first implementation. It's going to be a big, huge burden, I guess, for the Treasury Department to go through. And we'll have to upload every single contract and, and manually do all this stuff. But once we get it in place, this, this will save a lot of time. Any other questions? Call the roll, please. Mrs. Ennis? Yes. Mrs. Stepp? Yes. Mrs. Russell? Yes. Mr. Haberville? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Motion approved 5 0. Uh, number four, recommend a resolution to approve the following donations. We had an anonymous donation of $295 to the VHS Principals Fund. Uh, Colin Trimble donation of $15 to VHS Sailor Support. Madeline Chapter 204, order of the Eastern Star donation of $100 to the ES Principal Fund for Halloween candy. Great Midwest Sports donation of $1,000 to Athletics and Varsity News Network donation of $2,307.80 to Athletics. I'll move. Second. Uh, Mrs. Ennis? Yes. Mrs. Stepp? Yes. Mrs. Russell? Yes. Mr. Abramon? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Motion approved, 5 0 And lastly, recommend a resolution to approve the October appropriations, and that is attachment E. that stay the same from all the appropriations that we've had. Um, I've had to change a little bit on the taxes and a little bit on other sources of revenue. Again, what happens is these numbers are derived from the estimates that I put into our system for what I anticipate our revenue to be. I had to make a couple changes, mostly because of the change in House Bill 110, which I'll go into further detail next board meeting regarding the five-year forecast on that. Uh, but ultimately, I had to change the, the estimate a little bit. After changing the estimate, um, I did have to make some, again, changes to the general fund. Um, and then again, uh, the major ones are going to be the general fund and the 507, the SR3 fund. I didn't have that in the original appropriations because I wasn't sure the amount. Um, now that I have the amount, I put that in for, for, a, for an appropriation so we can spend up to that amount. All of the other ones are minor amounts. Uh, we got a little more revenue in for the bond. So I'll be having to pay that bond off a little sooner. Uh, a little bit more money in the permanent improvement fund to play for the bleachers that we have. That money never came through from the coverage from last year, so I just carried it over this year. Uh, food service minor adjustments. Again, the rest of these after food service, it's pretty much all just additional cash that we received. Any questions on that? Okay, we'll Mrs. Dennis? Yes. Mrs. Seth? Yes. Mrs. Russell? Yes. Mr. Haberman? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Motion approved 5 0. Thank you, Mr. Thank you.
Next, we have our consent agenda. The superintendent and treasurer recommend that the Board of Education approve the consent agenda items. Action by the Board of Education and adoption of the consent agenda means that all items approved by one single motion unless a member of the board, the treasurer, or the superintendent requests that any such item be removed from the consent agenda and voted upon separately. Number one, minutes of the September 13th, 2021 regular meeting. Number two, approve the agreement with contract for children with disabilities open enrollment between Huron City Schools and the Vermillion Local School District. Number three, approve the North Point ES, ESC Student Handbook for 2021-2022. Number four, approve the following employment action resignations for Adriana Ramirez, Vermillion High School Winter Guard Advisory, effective 9-27-2021. Bridget Voorhees, fourth grade te team leader, effective September 9th, 2021. Number five, maternity leave for the following. Shelby Thomas, approximately March 2nd, 2022 to May 16th, 2022. Number six, one year certified limited contract for the 2021-2022 contract school year to Sarah Worley, monitor SMS to BES educational aid. Lori Nick, monitor SMS to VHS Food Service. Jeffrey Keck, educational aid, SMS. Angela Radford, monitor at SMS. Dominic Januzzi, educational aid at SMS. And Amanda Brick, Brick, monitor at SMS. Number seven, pay $500 to Tony Hugo from the bowling donation fund for assisting with the bowling program. Anything needs to be removed. I'll move. Second. I'll move, please. Mrs. Ennis. Yes. Mrs. Seth. Yes. Mrs. Russell. Yes. Mr. Havenhill. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Motion approved 5-0. Next section of our meeting is public participation. If anyone would like to come up and speak, you can come up to the podium, state your name, and what we need to listen. Okay. Oh, just, I just had a question. Sure. I need the podium. Um, I, was, I had a question about the e-sports. E um, are, are these uh, sports that are watched virtually and not played on a, a court or a, or, a, or a field? It's I video think. games. Okay, um, so um, do fans watch these sports then virtually? Are, are, are the fans watch? Is, yeah, if, if, if there are fans, there are some schools that set up where like, if COVID has really kind of eliminated some of those visitors from coming in and watching those games. Mm -hmm. um, what they have typically done is set up, so say we were in this room and there would be computers around here, you could have fans watching from the middle, but right now we wouldn't anticipate having fans in until later, you know, until it was safe to do so or we had a large enough space. Are any sports canceled right now that are played on the court and field? What I'm getting at, or my question I think leads to, will these, will this pull students away from a sport that they've practiced and gained, you know, on, on the field and on the court, will, will they pull players away from that then to join the virtual games and and will that reduce school pride if you have now have that division of, you know, students that have worked hard for a sport, that have trained and, and had a lot of training physically, versus the students that can just go to a, that it's good with a, you know, a joystick or a, or a virtual game. I'm just wondering how that would, how that's going to build school spirit. I you know, I, I don't know. I, I think. When we started, um, Colleen Reedy had come in and asked for a swim team, and she was really pushing hard for it. And we were worried about the same thing. Is that swim team gonna take away from basketball right, right. or things like that? Yes. And really, I think it's kids that aren't involved with those sports that are going to be doing these sports. Well, the ones that, in the case of the swim team, the ones that were, do both. they found ways yeah. to do both. To do both. And, and I, and Hopefully so we do that have would a be lot the case of students there. that do basketball and swimming, and mm -hmm. so we may be able to do something like that as well. Yeah. And I think the intention would be to 
to maybe give kids who don't have a extracurricular that they identify with an option for something. Back to your back to your viewing, I know like the thing that Dusty's working on building because I teach out Dusty. They've had one before that we looked at at Dusty. So they'll have your little systems all around where you can watch, but then like the main event, I guess, when we get the finals, it's on a big TV server, they can watch it just like you would watch like a big fight or something. So everyone can view it. They, and the schools profit from that by charging to get in, so it builds revenue too. Uh, what about the younger students? You know, coming up in the ranks, you know, they're going to view this. And they're going to have the heroes on, you know, on the virtual screen if they're able to access it. Which I'm not, I'm not saying that. But eventually, is that going to pull, you know, the young younger students away from a sport that they're going to, you know, strive to, in the, you know, for in the future? That it's it's easier just to play the sport here, and I, I don't even have to run the track. You know, mom, I can. I can do this. I don't have to play on the tennis team, Mom, because I can go over here and click a switch. Well, my I question that kind of refers to yours is, why are we classifying video games as a sport? Well, it, right now, it's not a sport. It, it, who has created the so organization who called it like e-sports? Sports. What It'll run as a club. E sport, you it, kind of stand, like, it's like more of a club than It'll run it as an activity the right athletic now. department. It would be through. Right, yeah, there are some districts in the state that have classified it as a sport for them because, okay. they, they, because they have tryouts and they have varsity teams and they have JV teams. So then it's more like an extracurricular club versus a but, sport. But right, what they're going to have. It's more like a physical like, track, wrestling. It's, 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 a, it's a different mindset. I, it, it, it's going to take a lot of us some time to, to, under, to get our minds up. Yeah, that club. It's, it's a club right now, OHSAA, okay. the Ohio Athletic oh, Association. Have it? No, no. Okay. The Ohio so Athletic, the Ohio Athletic Association, the High School Athletic Association is looking into making it an actual sport I in the state understand. of Ohio. I feel like sports more like a physical ability, a physical, I, you know, yeah, I don't have, versus yeah, we don't have any control over that. Especially the parents, the parents, right? Very right. so. video game. So right it's now, like Fortnite. Yeah. Fortnite, you see what's on Fortnite? It's, it's that that game's crazy. You can interact with other people. How are you gonna that? You know what I mean? Like, you guys kind of think about the negatives of that. Well, I would think so that this would be a, like a closed yeah. contest, right? Okay, Where you're so just with other like, schools, right? Yeah, well, and I don't think it would all be monitored with a coach. coach. Some yeah, of these sports, some them. of these games don't have an ability to Yeah, to, mon like, to monitor So them. you can't yeah. necessarily, like, you have and to play on the internet with other students. Yeah. But I think it sounds like the practices for the school team part of it will be with a coach. It will not just be we send them home with an Nintendo Switch. Well, you're, <laughs> calling the coach, the you're calling a coach for video games, a video games task sport. You're calling a coach for video games and said that'd be like their group leader. It's an I, mean, I feel like it should be like a group thing versus like an athletic thing. Well, it's safe to say there's a lot of questions though. that really aren't answered, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. there's a lot of things this to think coming about. coming down from the Ohio High School Athletic Association. That's fine. It's going to be a sport, so that's not up to us. No, I understand. Ball. That's why yeah. we're not ever the Ohio Athletic Department says, but I'm just saying, like, right now, it would be a, right now it would be a club, an organization yeah. for kids to join, and there yeah. would be yeah. an right. advisor. That we have advisors. That would be monitored. Yeah. yeah. That would monitor all of that. So you're going to monitor all activity and who they talk to, like, and within those games. And how are you going to control that, though? Because like they said, there's a lot of those games you can't control your interaction with people. Yeah. We, we, that would be something we're still, about yeah, too. We, we're yeah. talking to other school districts. We've talked, we've had meetings with Ohio Esports, and those are things we'll have to work Absolutely, on. yeah. I'll come up to the podium. I have something to say. Go I mean, ahead. If you want, can I do this? Because no, I have an issue here as a quarantine policy. OK, so I have a little story to tell. Um, September 13th, my daughter came home with a I'm headache. Sorry, can you say your name, please? Oh, sorry, Kathleen Hines. I don't remember. I'm that. a parent um, of uh, four students in the Vermillion School District. So, uh, September 13th, my daughter called me and said she has a headache. She has allergies and allergies. We all do at, at different times. But uh, since she had headaches, stuff we know, came picked her up from school. Um, let's see. It says on this little form, I guess, the teacher, what I call a health assessment, but that the teacher did, uh, that you have to keep her home for 24 hours if they didn't answer yes to whatever, how many questions. So I did my due diligence, and I kept her home, made sure she wasn't running a fever or anything, and gave her some allergy medicine, and whatever. So then on September 22nd, I get a call from your school nurse 
saying that she has been in contact with somebody with COVID and that she now has to quarantine for 10 days. Um, I want to make clear, I did not hear from the health department, did not hear from any, any like health authority, just the school nurse, which is a little confusing. Um, they said that she came into contact with somebody on September 17th. Uh, she was not to come back to school until September 27th. And she, oh, sorry, September 28th, she could come back to school. And then you, they handed me, as the vice principal, to, the you two were there, which was just a coincidence. Vice principal walks out my child, hands me this letter, haven't heard from the Erie County Board of Health, on September 22nd, when she's been in contact on September 17th, supposedly, um, and says, your child's quarantined. So, to, you guys can be surprised, like, I'm a little mad, a little bit, and like, you know, I didn't hear from a health authority that she's been quarantined. I don't know any information about who she's been in contact with, whatever, which I get because HIPAA violations. However, so I couldn't get answers from your superintendent. Um, you know, I told him I was going to send her to school the next day. I did because I did not hear from the health authority. Um, so I sent her to school the next day. Your superintendent um, calls my husband, who acted ridiculous, but calls my husband and says, you uh, have to come get her, I will physically remove her. Where then my husband got a little upset, had some exchange of words with the superintendent, I'm talking to your officers, officer, lieutenant, or officer, it's a funny name, I remember that. Like officer, lieutenant, or whatever his name is. Is it a school resource Yeah, officer? the school resource officer, I forget what his name was. So then I wanted to find out some more information on how you guys had the authority to quarantine my daughter, not the Erie County Health Department, and just Sign, like really it looks like you know something you did in the PDF and just filled in the blanks and you know signed right on so I called the health department couldn't get a hold of the health department so I went down and sat down with Pete I actually went to the health department in the middle of the day the next day and sat down with Pete and he keeps telling me and denies and I recorded it he you know continues to tell me that you guys aren't allowed to contact trace that you guys aren't the ones contact tracing in the same conversation, he tells me that you guys have provided him with a um, seating chart of our students for contact tracing. And he continues, even though you guys have, I have it in letters from the city that you guys are contact tracing. I have it um, from you guys at board meetings saying that you're contact tracing. And I just have a couple questions for you guys that I'd really like you guys to answer. Is why is the uh, Erie County Health uh, Commissioner saying that you guys aren't allowed to contact trace. Um, you guys aren't, he even said this letter in my little interview with him, said this letter, this should have never happened. You guys aren't allowed to, your nurse is not allowed to quarantine. The only person that has the health authority to quarantine is the Erie County Health Commissioner and they have to do it through them. Not the school nurse calling me, telling me to come pick up my child because she's decided that she's in contact with somebody with COVID. Um, what are you guys doing about this contact tracing? Does that mean my child is around just a number of students all day long? Like they don't get to sit where they want at lunch, they have to stay within a certain group. Like how are you guys doing this? Um, my big question with this form is, when did I sign a form saying you could give her a health assessment? Anybody might get the health assessment. Because that's against, uh, FERPA, which you guys should know, um, section 300, 300, uh, 2, uh, 56301C to subsection 2, 56566 subsection 1. Um, I have to sign something for you guys to give an assessment to any of my children for any reason. And when you're asking them if they have a fever, congestory nose, nausea, diarrhea, or throat headache, I mean, if I ask them this, that's fine. But whoever, whatever teacher um, asked Alyssa, because she asked to go to the nurse's office because she had a headache, is has n has no authority for me to ask my children about their health. Period. Um, and they're not allowed to do that. Uh, you guys even said in your little quarantine and isolation, remaining in the cornerstone of public health. You guys said local health departments are encouraged to consult with their. Uh, what does it say? Local health departments continue to have the authority and responsibility to issue quarantine and or isolation orders when appropriate and necessary. If that's true, why did I never get contact from the health department and until I decided to go there myself? Show them this letter, the, even your county health commissioner says the letter's not valid, that you're not allowed to hand me this letter, um, even though you did that, he was gonna take care of it. 
So that's another question. Is, are you guys still handing out these letters and is the nurse still quarantining people without the health department? I understand you guys are working with the health department, but do you actually have a health department official here in the school that's doing the contact tracing? Because according to the Erie County Health Commissioner, and I can send you the recording and what he said, um, you're not allowed to contact trace. And then you're not, even though you guys gave him a seating chart and according to my kid, like you can't have lunch with different people. And, um, and I wanna know actually really, where does it state that you guys have the authority to contact trace kids? And I don't really understand that whole, the whole thing because the kids leave your school and go around, who knows? Nobody knows. Do you guys know what the kids do after school? No? Okay. Uh, so what are you guys gonna do about this quarantine thing? Because then I had a healthy child out for 10 days, which also doesn't make sense because my one child has to be out for 10 days, but the other three that live in the same home went to school the entire time. Does that make any sense? So I think you have some questions that, you know, the authority to contact trace, those are questions that... That you're contact tracing, so what authority from the health department do you have, even though the health, Erie County Health Commissioner is saying you have no authority, what authority do you have to do that? Well, we and how are you doing that? No, and, and here's, here's what happens in the schools when we have a positive case. We do have seating charts. Kids are sitting in assigned seats. They are in assigned seats. Did they do that previously? Yes, previously COVID? That. Not pre for lunch not too. No. Okay. No. It, this all so that sounds COVID. like contact tracing. You're keeping them in there. I call them little well, we have pies. to. We have to be able to ensure that we know where students are sitting in case there is a positive case. Because, because you're con asked, because you're contact tracing. We are asked to provide a list of students that could possibly potentially be in close contact. So then you students. provide a list of students to the county health department. Whose authority is it to call me and quarantine my child? Only the county right. health department. Your nurse is the one that did so. Maybe you got a letter clock. But you, you have a letter from Erie County Health Department. No, that was printed off and handed to me by your vice principal. But you have a letter from and, the, and the, the health, health commissioner department. said this letter is not valid. Like that letter Actually, should have never have been given to, to me. I would by have this to call Pete Shane. I can send you the interview. I recorded I, it. And the I, conversation I, and I, I believe you and I trust yeah. you and I have no problem calling. And he you. keeps denying that you guys are contact tracing, even though you're you're telling me right now. We provide tracing. well. I, I they have certain rules. I'm providing a list of students based on where they're sitting and in in, in the. In the it says in letters from the district that I have that says your contact tracing. That Erie County Health Department official is telling me you have no authority to contact trace. You're still not answering my question. Before COVID. The list is going to. No, but listen, before COVID, right? please stop talking. Before COVID, you did <laughs> not. No, I'm not being no, rude. Don't answer those I'm trying to get my It's disrespectful and it's rude. Before COVID, you didn't have a seating chart. You didn't have a lunch chart. Now after COVID, you have a seating chart, you have a lunch chart. You know where these kids have been, you know who these kids have been with. In the school. The only, way to provide, contact tracing. the only way to provide data for contact tracing is to do that. Okay, so the school is contact tracing. So what, that's why I said, what Erie County Health Official do you have in your school doing that? We, we, we provide data we, to the Erie yes. County Health Department. Well, the Erie County, so County Health Official is telling me that you're not allowed to do that. Not allowed to provide data. You're not allowed to provide any information about contact tracing. It's personal. And me and him went over that. We said, I said, if Billy's sitting here, if you see that Anna's sitting here, so and if Billy's sitting here, they're sitting here. How do you know that? Well, I need to call him. Yeah. I, I would definitely call him. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I have your concerns. And then on top of it, like my other three children out of school, you quarantine my one kid, but the other three who live in, in the home, have contact with each other every day, are at your schools. What sense does that make? Well, your daughter was quarantined because she was a close contact, but, there, but the siblings would be a secondary contact. Mm -hmm. But they live in the same house. That is a, that is a that is like a direct cut. She's going to contact me. You guys think she has COVID? It's not direct. If, no, it's, it's not direct unless contact. your daughter came down with it. Then the okay. siblings would have been quarantined also. Okay. And yeah. your school nurse isn't supposed to be quarantining people, correct? Erie County Health Correct. Department. Okay. So that's my other question. Why is your nurse calling me and other parents and quarantining children? So it sounds like we had to get clarification. And you know what? Honestly, maybe maybe just the message was delivered wrong. 
Yeah. Because, and how long is the contract going right. to continue for? Like, are they going to be for the entire year in their little tracing pods or whatever you guys are calling them, seating charts? I don't think we know the answer to that. Okay. So you're going to continue contact tracing? We're going to continue to follow the health department's direction. Okay. And provide the information that they ask for. I would call Pete because Pete's telling me. And I'll send you guys the uh, link to my interview with Pete, that hour and a half. Okay? And you guys can hear what he has to say because he said a lot. That's just a little bit of what he said. I'm not going to get into everything because some of it's apolitical and I don't think it really needs to be said here. But um, the contact tracing and, and also the health assessment. Like, how can your teachers ask my child a health question without my prior written authorization? That, that is FERPA and that is HIPAA. So when I know you guys say you said nothing to do HIPAA. Yeah. Um, I would I would she look into that though, because I'm just saying this right now. No, no, no staff can ask any about my children about their health. She has written it down okay. and I know that Lisa will follow up. I would just appreciate that. She will follow Thank up you. on it. Okay, and I'll follow up with all of you too. Okay? That's fine. Thank you. had a meeting with uh, the superintendent, I believe it was last week, and I, I find what Kathleen says here a little disturbing because he painted a little different picture of me. He told me specifically that the principal of the school conducts the contact tracing. The principal is the one that interviews the children and finds out who they came in contact with and such. He then is in conjunction with the nurse and then and then they supposedly hand it over to Pete Shea and his department. Now, some of the things that I find a little disturbing with this is even on your website, it states that you are contact tracing. Now, when I asked, when I asked Phil, um, who is qualified in the school district to contact trace? He said specifically nobody. Nobody is qualified to do that. So, and what's even more disturbing is she's she's telling me that a teacher assessed her her student. Right here. And that, from my understanding, isn't. And this is coming directly from the superintendent as well. That doesn't happen. Mr. Lacasco at the high school, I think, is the representative that does the contact tracing from what he had told me. So if teachers themselves are asking these kind of questions, that is a serious problem because you don't have those rights to be able to ask my particular daughter or children their health status. It's actually in, it's in um, the board policy that the, that the school district cannot diagnose or um, I forget what policy number it was, to be honest with you, but you can't diagnose, assess any kind of medical condition. That's, it's in your, uh, like your prescription medicine. You can't diagnose or assess anything. So even in your bylaws, you're breaking your own bylaws to do this, to do the contact tracing, which nobody's qualified to do in the first place, right? I also had a meeting with Pete Shea. Pete tells me that there is a third party contact tracing that is happening. So his office isn't even handling the third party contact tracing. So what's happening is he's leaning on you guys, making you guys the suckers, forgive me, to do his work for him because he's understaffed because this, the state took his funding away and took his employee. So he's writing a health order, handing it to you guys, excuse me, the school district, the teacher, whoever, and they're the ones that are issuing them. I don't know how that's legal, how you guys are getting away with that. It may have come from the health director, but the health director is not handing it to anybody. That's coming from the school, that looks, that's bad optics. And I tell you what, I'm very, very disturbed that you are giving my daughter's seating chart or location in the school district 
to anybody. That's a huge privacy violation. There could be tons of reasons why that should not take place. Somebody that's not in the school district, which I specifically entrust the school district, you guys in the administration, to protect my daughter, you just gave her whereabouts to whomever. I don't know Pete Shade up until Pete this Shade. year. I didn't know Pete Shade. Well, he's so, here. Well, well, you can we'll let you know. know. But personally, we don't know. Nor I know, but just make sure we're not giving it to whoever. I can give you permission to give it to him. I, I understand what I do understand what you mean. Okay, thank you. And I, I understand that he's a professional, but there is no that information can get lost in transit. That information can be taken from his desk. That information can be used for some very bad reasons. What if there's a person in his office that comes across that information? That's not localized to the school anymore. You've allowed my daughter's personal, private information where her, she's located every day to somebody else throughout the entire day. So that's that's really really concerning to me. And in two days, I believe Senate Bill 22 kicks in, and you are no longer allowed to treat students that are vaccinated different than students that are unvaccinated. So I'm wondering what you guys are going to do, especially with like the quarantine chart, um, how that's going to play out. Because you can no longer quarantine students that are unvaccinated versus vaccinated. You have to treat them all exactly the same. So I, I don't know exactly how that's going to play out. And you guys were so concerned about esports today that we didn't we didn't cover that. That seems to be pretty important going forward here. So I, I don't know if you guys have an answer for that or if you guys have talked about that. But when I talked to Phil, the mask mandate was such a big deal, right? Everybody's feathers are all ruffled up about the mask mandate, right? But the quarantine chart, that, that wasn't a, I don't think that that should be even in effect, but that wasn't a board decision. You guys did not vote on that. You guys voted on the mask mandate. You didn't vote on the quarantine chart. That seems to be more effective, more affecting our students than wearing the masks. How is that not a board decision? But one was and one wasn't. Still have a department of health. I'm sorry? It's a department, department of health. The, the, he's, he, but he has reminders. to do that. You guys, I mean, health and school administrators not allowed my, to contact trace by well, law. We're talking about the quarantine chart, though, which is coming from the Ohio Department of Health. So my understanding yeah, so is that he doesn't have, according to Senate Bill 22, he can't that do that one. either. All he can do is recommend. So yeah. there are, so, there, we've had some discussions about that Senate bill, that, that October 13th date that you're when talking When did you have about. these discussions? I, Phil and I talked about it. I, I can't tell you. It, we know we're aware of this bill that's coming out. And, and so there, I will definitely touch base with him tomorrow about. I believe I have to do it. Uh, the last one yeah. the one before and that. I, and I, will I, brought, I know, I definitely brought it up. No, not the last name, the one before that. My right. legislative report, I brought it up then. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we I just want to know that there, there was something that we're going to do going forward with that. I, I uh, don't know, and I, can't, I don't want to speak out of turn, and I can <coughs> contact you with that. I, I'm not quite sure if that, if Ohio Department of Health is changing that quarantine chart based on that Senate Bill 22 or not. So those are questions that I will get back to you on. Right, so there is some kind of documentation that you guys have that says that that quarantine chart was enforced by the health department. You have that document. Is, is this a blank statement that you guys were just adhering to because you think that that was the right thing to do? Or was there an actual a piece of paper saying this is a health order and you were to follow that health order? They, I, I can't I don't know that off the top of my head. I've been I can trying tell to get you this that, answer. This yeah, I can tell answered. you that they provided us with that. My understanding document. is that the quarantine chart was just a recommendation passed from the Ohio Department of Health. It was a recommendation from the CDC, yeah. and it was also a recommendation from the, the local boards of health. But that's all that it is. It's a recommendation. It, yeah. My understanding is Phil just instituted it. Yeah. And that's that's how it went. He just said, "We're doing this." How is that? How is that not a board vote? But the mask mandates are. It seems like there's a little bit of. Especially the quarantine effects. I, I don't understand how well, that works. And then the quarantine, we we don't have the authority to quarantine. So the quarantine chart would fall on Erie County Health Department, the health department, to determine what would constitute a quarantine. But you're a nurse quarantined my daughter, not the Erie so Health did, Department. Did Pete Shade say that your daughter was not actually quarantined then? Yeah, he said, he's like, what do you want to do? And I said, I'm not going to like take this to litigation, which I'm very close to doing. I said, I, but I'll go with it because it was another day until she actually could come back. 
but he even said, this is not appropriate. I will handle this with Phil. This should have never happened. I should be content. I said, just like if you got chlamydia, gonorrhea, any infectious communicable disease, it is the, on the health department to tell me that. And I was not contacted by not one to get a letter in the mail, even after the fact to get a letter in the mail, even before I didn't get answers. So I showed up there and just happened Pete was there and sat down and talked to him because I wanted to know who this AF was on this order that said from the health department was prepared. And I wanted to see what was in her case number two because it's just very suspect. But I didn't bring this up either. Is September 17th is when she got contacted. She was in school Friday all day on September 17th and Monday and most of Tuesday. You did bring up, you gave us the dates, so you did No, I gave you the dates, but she wasn't home until the 20, until the 22nd. Yeah, no, you did. You but she came in contact, which I, I, it's been a theme with other parents I've spoken to that that's how it's going down. But the theme also is they hear from the nurse and then they hear from the health board, the board of county health. That is not the way it is supposed to go. It is supposed to be from the board of health only. And then if we want to let the school know, and then the school wants to do some kind of tracing, that's on us. But we don't have to report anything to you in regards to COVID, and it's all through Erie County Health Department. You guys aren't allowed to do any of this. According to Pete, and Pete denies, and I mean, I will send you the recording, implicitly denies that you guys are contact tracing. And I even told him, I was like, it could tomato, tomato. If this person, I used an example, if this person's sitting here, how do you know where all these people are sitting? And that's where he slipped up with the seating chart. And then he was like, oh, but we're not, we're not contacted. They're not contact tracing. I said, who do you have at the school with the, with the, is this Ashley Franks at the epidemiologist that, you know, prepared this statement at the school? No. Who is at the school from the Board of Health? Nobody. Well, then what authority do they have to contact trace? They don't, so, they're not contact tracing. Well, we provide the data, you know, so. It, so you're contact tracing. You're providing the data of where my daughter's been all day. Your are contact you're providing tracing a my list daughter. Of students that have possibly okay. come in contact We're with gonna change the That's exactly what he says too when I say, it. instead of saying contact tracing, we provide where they are. Well, you wouldn't know that unless you're tracing who she was in contact with. We are providing a list of those students. Who she was in contact with. But, but now this is interesting with the principal interviewing. Did Phil say that? Phil said the principal's interviewing students. Who the principals around. hold the seating charts. The, the principal is is the one that is conducting the, the contact tracing. And um, I, I'm not sure how that goes through all the schools. It's just what he had, had told me. And that none of the teachers were involved in the contact tracing. I do have a quick question. Do any of you think it's appropriate if the vice principal comes out with my daughter and hands me a letter and says good luck? I was there Don't to watch that. To That's me. actually what happened. I mean, you should have seen my daughter six. And my daughter came to this questioning with Pete, with me and Pete sat down. I brought my daughter with them, with me. Because I'm like, well, here's a healthy child that is now not in school because of this order when you, you weren't even involved in it. And really, I think it's because she came in Monday a little late, and the lady at the front office asked her if she was sick because she stuffed up because she has allergies. And then it was just so funny. That's the day the letter was written. And then the next day she's gone when she's been back to school for two days. Like those two days she's back, she's naturally. I just want to clarify this. something. I'll step down. So I, I want to know. Um, so you were not given any piece of documentation stating that the health, um, the quarantine chart was instituted by the health department, specifically Pete Shea. So you don't have like a, an actual health order, order stating this is the quarantine chart that you have to use. So the quarantine, then my understanding is Mr. Peppin instituted that of his own volition, correct? Because you guys did not vote on that, mm -hmm. and it wasn't. But it did come from the health department, right? And and we have all along followed the the recommendation of the health department when it comes to quarantine. Sure, I can But he, she denies that you're an arm of the health department. Sounds could, like he denies a lot of things. I, I does. does. I'm, I'm not, like... We're not an arm of the health department, but, but, you're but based on but based on the fact that right, you have a lot of schools in Erie County and a lot of students in Erie County. It would be impossible for the health department to trace these kids. Exactly. Yeah, you guys are making it possible. So we we, we provide the answers by to the questions so that they can make the decision. But in doing so, you impossible. violate their rights. Yes. and that's the problem. And that's why we come to you week after week after week. Oh no, that's all. I'm pretty sure before the pandemic, there were seating charts. 
No, you just answered that. No, no it's not just no, seating con uh, uh, charts, Mr. Johnson. You, no, it's okay, but you said they're contact you tracing these kids You're with seating charts. Oh, because you, you said that when I was speaking that you didn't yeah, have seating charts pre COVID. I didn't have seating charts. She mentioned them. Because I've talked for 19 years, I always provide a seating chart. Not To the Board of Health? Did you give it to whoever asked? Did you give it to the Board of Health? I gave it to anybody who was official asked for it, so our police department would have it. Our fire would have it. Do you have a problem with them having it? But what this no, guy... I'm saying, do you have a problem, though? Because this... This is not a seating chart. Well, listen, I want to respond to what you just well, asked I'm me. I'm going to tell you, though. You asked me a direct question, so I'd like to respond to that, sir. Will you let me respond? Sure, right. you let us talk. Go ahead. Well, what I hear is parents telling you that you're violating people's constitutional rights. It's in the Ohio State Constitution that so you seating chart. At that doing this constitutes a health care system, facility. all right? You're putting our kids in a contact tracing situation, which puts them in a health care system yeah. that's run yeah. by the health director. No, and what he's doing cool. is he's sending it off to a third party that he doesn't know. No. He just signed a contract with them. That's it, all right? Our kids are in a health care system. They have rights. We've said enough is enough. It needs to stop. There's an, even an Ohio law that says that that flow chart that you're using to quarantine kids is, is not legal anymore because it discriminates masked and unmasked kids, all right? We're asking for relief. We're asking for solutions. We so, don't want the status quo. So what are you going to do to fix it? I think what needs to happen is a follow-up on this. Yeah, meeting with Pete Shade, and we, so if we can just please... Let us do a meeting. Let us get some clarification here on everything. We, we all want to be invited. We don't want to guess where the location okay, is going to be. Listen, we're not going to have a meeting with the five of us without you guys. What I mean is have a meeting back with you guys, whether that be Phil, whether that be Mrs. Feliz. We, we are legally not allowed to have meetings as much as you think we break the law. I promise we don't. Okay, we've never. Yeah, we are not allowed to gather more than two at a time. It's not a matter what I think. It's what I'm witnessing. Have you ever seen us together? Have you seen us together? Where do you witness a private meeting? Where do you witness a private meeting? I've watched you guys break Sunshine Miles right in front of me. I've watched Phil. One by one, and give me the They're very brave. Like as long as they tell you about a meeting, which community stuff. You guys haven't been honest to us at all from the beginning. Okay, that's not true. That is not true at all. I have. Well, you say it's not contact tracing, right? And then you contact tracing and give it a different name. We we're going to continue our meeting now. We have listened. We have listened. We have everything, literally everything, written down. And then nothing's going to happen next month. Nothing's going to change. We're going to get in contact with Pete Shane. And we will ask him these questions because I think Pete Shane's throwing everybody under the bus. I'm getting, sorry. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what it sounds like. I know that that's what's happening. That is but absolutely I'm what's I'm trying happening. to really work with you guys. I agree. And I, I appreciate asking, that. I've been asking the same question. So I'm not getting to any answer. So just, we were going to fix this. And we were going to figure this, this third, out. This is yeah. the third month in a row that I've asked about this quarantine chart. Who has authority? And I'm going to I'm going to come back next month. So we have been following. Pete Shade's recommendations to us. He is now telling you guys that this isn't the, a legal thing yeah. to do, but he's telling us to do it. So we are we have everything written down, and we were we're going to figure it out. And just and so you know, that's a, a police. There's laws for that. You have to give them any information that they want. It's different than the health department. I just want to I just want to put that out there. Eric. If yeah. the police department asks you specifically, you there are laws that say that you have to give them. Information, but there's no law saying that you have to give the information. But I don't understand that. The, okay. the whole thing was a seating chart. Like, it's not a big deal. I give a seating chart to people. How many kids do you have? I know that you got. I think you got two. Right? This is about my kids, right? Would you care? Would how would you feel if they if their information, no matter how private or dumb you think it is, was provided to somebody else without your prior knowledge? Where or they sit? Are purpose. you okay with that? It, where they sit, it doesn't bother me. Well, it or bothers me. It bothers me. That's fine. That's fine. We are going to talk to Thank Pichet. You. We are going to get some answers. I and then you can talk to us at the next meeting. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, and I do appreciate you coming, but we are going to move on. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? This is all on a positive note, I can tell you that. Um, and it all has been. But um, I was, can I your name? Oh, be sure. Robin Aston. And uh, I just was reading the photo journal, and I liked what I heard Sarah Stepp say that the best curriculum to help our students succeed and let's get back and let's get back to the thinking about our students and what they're learning and Chris Hammermill said continue to listen to our community and I have I have really witnessed to this I mean we've ranted and raved I mean I, they, they have listened to us and I've come to three months of, of this and the parents also did their homework during the mass fiasco Absolutely. 
oh my goodness, I was amazed. There's more things coming around that I think we should be aware of and that I'd like to raise the questions tonight. Um, and it is, it is I, will, I will just say right now that the critical race theory is an elitist ideology. I have been studying it. It is under the guise of human infrastructure. And I, um, I will tell you that it aligns itself with hatred toward the United States. It wants to change America's understanding of itself. It, it endangers hard-won liberty in this country, and it, it displays, it puts history with phony scholarship. It is not academic. And I, I, I'm afraid it's going to seep into, our, into our, our curriculum here. And I would like to ask the question, how will we know if our children are learning it? How will they, how will they stave off the tenets of critical race theory and call it something else and still have it in the textbooks? How will you make us aware that, you know, if, if it's here or if it's not, I've been told it's not, but they have it under guises of different things. Equity training. Yeah, Equity and our training. and tax payer, it, our taxpayer is paying for this equity training. It, equity is not equality. I, I've I've read the terminology. It is it is not good, and it's 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 twisting our thinking. And pretty much, we recite a narrative and we start to believe it. And the narrative that's coming out is um, something like this: um, unique social and emotional learning. We have to do that. No. No, we just teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. Let's get back to the basics. And um, so I guess how will you reassure us um, that, that these theories are not brainwashing our children? I know that principals and teachers sign off on textbooks. And, and, and that, because I remember doing that with my principal. And, and we, we reviewed it, and, and, and the principal and teachers worked together. But there might have to be more of a, um, you know, a, more of a net out there to, to bring in what exactly are the textbooks coming into the, the school system and teaching from kindergarten up. And I would be one to, to offer my services to help uh, be a watchdog on it. So I'm just say, I, that's all I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anything else? Safe and location of upcoming board meetings. Board meetings will be held in the workforce development room right here at Vermilion High School, 1250 Sanford Street. Regular meeting Wednesday, November 10th at 7 p.m. That is a date change. A regular meeting Monday, December 13th at 7 p.m. An organizational meeting Monday, January 10th at 6.45 and a regular meeting Monday, January 10th at 7 o'clock. One question I have on this is, when does the posting end for the superintendent's position? November 5th. I think the 4th or 5th. 4th or 5th. Is it the 4th or 5th? Okay. Because that's going to generate additional meetings, and I didn't want, I don't want anything to creep into the schedule prior to November 10th, right? right. I don't want that we haven't at least advertised or talked about. So, yeah, so if it's November 5th, then I, anything we do. When the posting is finished, he will then get the applications to us, and then we will we'll each individually get all of the applications, and then we'll have to set up meetings to yep. interview and do that. So there will be some additional meetings. Okay. Those will be an executive session. Those will be executive sessions. Yeah, the process of going through and choosing the new superintendent and interviewing any of the candidates, that's an executive session. That is the board doing that. Mostly because there's other people who may be, right, other people applying here and maybe not letting their districts know yet that they are looking elsewhere and we need to keep their privacy as well. And, but they are published meetings, even though they are executive yes. sessions. So. That the reason I brought it up is I would not want to give the impression that we're that we're meeting on other subjects, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. behind closed doors that you know is not available to the public. That's not the case. But there will be other meetings. Will we be able to ask him or the candidate any questions? No. Okay. Yeah, it's, I mean it's a series right. of interviews, right? It's, just a, it's a job interview, no more than when we had our past 
principals' interviews, you know, we conduct those. Do you have a list of questions that you would yeah, be asking now for? that we could look at or review? We don't yet. For the superintendent search? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We will be getting a list together. I have also, I already talked to um, Pat Graves, and I'm going through and calling principals and teachers and janitorial staff, and I think you were going to help me as well, and we're asking people in our district, in all aspects of our district, what do they think, because they're working with the superintendent hand in hand, what do they think we need to look for? Um, they're here every day, I'm not. So I'm, I'm getting principals' opinions, aides, nurses, teachers, um, we'll probably be talking to Sean, you know, people that work with the superintendent on a day-to-day -day basis, what do they feel like we need in this district? What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? What do we need to look for to move forward? But we would also so we'll potentially do. welcome public feedback too, and right? We may do that. If so there's something that, you know, you think, hey, this would be a good question, or I think this is what you need to look for in a superintendent, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And you guys are, when is the, November 5th is when you stop taking applications, but when are you looking on a time frame for actually? That's actually on our website, I believe. The, the, time, the, time. the, the time frame is posted, and it'll say like when our first set of interviews are, that's all on our um, website. Right. So I don't know basically, all the top of my basically, head. Basically, no, right. well, the timeline, the timeline is, is Preferably by the end of the calendar year, right, to have a, a candidate. Year, so right. Okay. We will have the hopefully to have a, a new superintendent, but they will not start until the following next year. school year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now we have our adjournment. Second. Please. Mr. Dennis? Yes. Mrs. Stepp? Yes. Mrs. Russell? Yes. Mr. Haberman? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Motion approved 5-0 and the time is 8-16 p.m.